interprète là chaque les louem ni dit m'a besoin pour vous il va faire moi après ça quand il y a l'invité pour m'aller pour me venir côté qui font vous demander pour me faire sexe ça avec malgré m'a voulu le forcer me forcer m'a ça moi dit non 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 après il fait force avec la vie de femme c'est sécurité ou tant que m'a voulu l'invité qu'on y a nous qu'on y a tout et violé, ou t'es une violée, moi. On l'a pas gagné tout, mais petit ou vin, vin grand. Est-ce que vous parlez de Dill, qui est papa ou yé? Je dis, je dis, son ministre, mais elle va prendre ici, elle va penser que c'est vrai. While the United Nations is known for distributing aid, providing security, and promoting human rights, more recently, their reputation's been overshadowed by widespread reports of sexual abuse by their own peacekeepers. Much of this media attention has focused on the Central African Republic, but one of the missions with the most allegations against UN personnel is in Haiti. The mission there, MINUSTA, began in 2004 in order to stabilize what was an increasingly violent region. Jean-Max Bellarive was prime minister from 2009 to 2011 and worked closely with UN officials during those years. As you know, we don't have an army in Haiti. So the uh, security issue is always at the top of the, the, the problems that we have to, to confront. Uh, the Haitian government with the international community felt at some period that the best solution on the short term was to have a mission of the United Nations. In response to gang violence, civilians alleged that UN peacekeepers executed aggressive crackdowns, in some cases, killing civilians. In the Boston, in the Boston, there are, the minister killed people. Two children in the bed, mother and father. Killed. While those types of crimes are no longer reported, allegations of sexual violence persist. Women and children throughout Haiti have accused a number of UN peacekeepers and personnel of rape and varying degrees of sexual assault. We traveled outside of Port-au-Prince to a town called Leogon, where in 2007, over 100 UN soldiers were accused of exploiting and abusing minors. Gina was 15 at the time. We spoke to another woman in Dilma 33, a Port-au-Prince slum where she says she gave birth to her daughter as a result of being raped by a UN soldier. She didn't report the crime for fear of repercussions and for the same reason asked that we not reveal her identity. Fait 
We tracked down a former UN investigator from their Office of Internal Oversight. This is the unit that investigates misconduct, including crimes by UN employees and uniformed personnel deployed throughout the world. He voluntarily quit in 2015 because of what he says was a fundamentally flawed system. We obtained confidential UN documents that detail cases of sexual exploitation and abuse. I want to show you these to see if you recognize this case, because I want to ask you a couple questions. The first case involves uh, an alleged victim, a teen orphan, who had lost her eye. Um, and she alleges that a UN civil affairs officer uh, took off her clothes, beat her, forced her to have sex, anally and vaginally put a pillow over her head to muffle her screams, said that if she told anyone, he would kill her. Um, terrible uh, suffering afterward. He denies all of the charges. What was the outcome in that case? The result of the investigation was that there was insufficient evidence to prosecute. Case closed and the staff member has been advised accordingly. And there were three the same from memory. Um, and rather than investigating it as a pattern of behavior, they were deliberately opened as, as three separate cases from um, from the beginning. He was accused three times the, by three different people that, that's correct. of sexual exploitation and abuse crimes. Yeah, two of them were allegations of rape, and the third one was a sexual assault or a sexual harassment. Right. But three cases were opened and three cases were closed. And on the scale of the type SEA cases you see come into the office, how egregious was this one? This was, on, on a one to ten scale, this was, this was, a, this was a ten but the case was not substantiated. The findings did not support misconduct by clear and convincing evidence. What happens from the time that a complaint is filed to the time that you get it to start the investigation? Um, what often happens is that uh, it will go through what is called an assessment process. That basically means that the subject, and the, the, all the witnesses, the victims, will be interviewed, trying to determine whether or not there is probable cause to initiate an investigation. Peter says that assessment process can actually be used to weed out reports and keep the official number of substantiated cases low. I have uh, known of cases where uh, an extraordinary effort has been put in to uh, this assessment. It is in the organization's best interests that the, uh, there is no investigation because the case is not substantiated. That can be done uh, simply by discrediting witnesses or reporting that the, the witnesses are, are not reliable or there is uh, insufficient proof. By vague, malgré qu'on l'ait été venu chercher, mon Nations Unies, il est venu chercher moi, il est monté pour moi ça vem, il a posé mes questions, il a répondu toutes questions yo, et yo ouais pas de mentir dans le bail. Si était quelques petits millions d'emmdé, peut-être nous devons avoir de justice. Nations Unies t'as mal vu ouais ça, mal vu ouais. Because not all cases are included in the official numbers, we spoke with a former UN human rights officer, Brian Concanon, to try to understand how prevalent these crimes are. What percent of assaults that are happening do you think end in some sort of conviction and punishment? If you look at how the UN system systematically excludes complaints, I, I can't believe that, that one tenth of one percent of all the of all the assault and the abuse lead to any negative consequences for the perpetrator. How could a perpetrator be brought to justice? Who would have to act in order to make that happen? A perpetrator certainly can be brought to justice. If you look at the UN system, there's, there's lots of procedures that allow that to happen. It's just that those procedures in practice are not allowed to work. So let's just say in the small amount of cases where an investigator from New York does go down to Haiti, does investigate a crime and finds that there is evidence, mm -hmm. what happens then? Who does the prosecution? If they're peacekeeping troops from another country, then they're, they're to be court-martialed through that country's process. And that has happened in a few cases. If it's a UN non-uniformed personnel, so a UN staffer, and, and it, the the, the case does get to New York somehow, and New York does find it's, it's warranted, then they can waive that immunity. 
um, and, and you can have a pursuit in Haitian courts. Has that ever happened? Uh, that has never happened to my knowledge in Haiti, and, and the mission's been going on for 10 years. The UN itself can't prosecute its personnel. For peacekeepers, it's the responsibility of the member state where the peacekeeper is from. But there often isn't much compelling them to prosecute their own citizen. This can result in lighter sentences or no punishment at all. You could eliminate 90% of the sexual misconduct in the UN overnight simply by making it very clear that not only is the immunity going to be removed automatically, but cases are going to be referred for local investigation as soon as there is probable cause to believe that a rape case or a, a sexual assault has taken place. These accusations run deeper. According to the Government Accountability Project, hundreds of UN employees, current and former, claim they've been retaliated against after speaking out about the organization. We tracked down one former UNPOL or UN police officer from the US who was based in Haiti in 2011 and said she received pushback after reporting two cases of sexual assault by her UN colleagues. I thought the UN was a great organization. It's all these countries coming together to try to help another country. And I just thought it would be a great job. She was hired by the contractor PAE. The State Department hires them to supply and train US personnel for UN missions, like the one in Haiti. At what point did you start to notice unprofessional behavior by some of your colleagues? 2011. The camp committee complained and said that there were three unpoles in the camp picking up women. And I said, what? And they said, yeah, they're picking up women. They're young girls, too. And they said that these guys have been doing this apparently for a long time. What exactly did the report say? What was the crime? The report was sexual abuse, sexual exploitation. And it was supposed to be committed by three unpulls. One was my team leader, and two others were just regular unpulls. According to this officer, she passed the report to her camp coordinator, but apparently the appropriate UN office never received it. She says it wasn't until she sent new victim details to UN security and hand delivered a copy of the report that it was finally received. She says they then sent an assessment team from New York to meet her. They interviewed me for three and a half hours. It was a little bit hostile because they kept trying, asking me the same question, I guess hoping for another answer, because I mean, I, I don't know what else I could tell them except for the same thing over and over. Which is that you just passed a report from civilians to supervisors. Yes, I said, look, I was down at the office, this is what they told me, and that's it. I did not see anything. You spoke to this UNPOL officer recently, and as an investigator, did you find her credible? I did. It was a police officer of 10 years experience who received a complaint Right, from uh, people with whom she had uh, established a relationship of trust. Uh, yes, I spoke to her and I found her credible. And yet the, the UN went to great lengths to uh, engineer a situation where the complaint would not be investigated. Five months later, she says another civilian approached her with a second complaint. So she reported the claim as she did the first. What was the reaction to you passing along a second report of sexual exploitation? Oh, I don't think they liked that at all. I ended up with a really bad evaluation for my team, a different team later. It's interesting because at a lot of other organizations, you would be reprimanded if you didn't pass that knowledge along. Yes. And instead here, you're being reprimanded for actually passing along a report of sexual abuse. Yes. 10 months into her one year contract, this anonymous officer says she was fired. So I was told I was going to be going to a meeting to meet with a PAE program manager. He told me that my contract was being ended. He said it was because that what I reported in January was unfounded. The sexual abuse incident? Yes. I said, so basically you're firing me for being a whistleblower. The UN's Conduct and Discipline Unit said they did not find a link between her contract being ended and her reports. Once she left the mission, it took her several years to find a job, despite being qualified in her area. I couldn't get a job. I applied at various uh, companies for contracts. I applied at DynCorp to go back to Haiti. I applied at Agility to go to Nepal as a part-time um, police advisor. What's it like to go up against a contractor like PAE and the UN? Um, <laughs> it's like David and Goliath. I mean, you're fighting somebody who is determined to crush you. If you could go back in time, would you have reported those two cases? Probably not. 
It would have been the wrong thing to do to not report it, but after all the grief that I've had to go through, I probably would not have reported it. When we reached out to PAE for a response, they told us they do not comment on individual cases, but that they take any report of sexual abuse seriously. But this is not a problem specific to Haiti. These types of allegations have been made against UN personnel in 14 of the current 16 UN missions. In 2015, an explosive internal UN report was leaked by a senior human rights officer, revealing widespread abuse of children as young as nine years old by French soldiers in the Central African Republic. Sexual exploitation and abuse of power have no place, least of all, in the United Nations, which stands for the rights of the world's women and children. The UN chief expressed his anger over allegations of sexual abuse by international peacekeepers in the Central African Republic. Last month, an independent panel condemned the UN's response to the allegations as seriously flawed. That independent panel, appointed to investigate the UN's handling of these cases, was led by Marie de Chomps, a former Canadian Supreme Court justice. Instead of reporting the allegations on an urgent manner, as the egregiousness of the alleged conduct dictated, they were kept quiet. There were little boys as young as nine years old being sexually abused, and the UN sat back and did the square root of nothing, and did less than nothing, and actually was more concerned about protocol than the welfare and the, the mental well-being of the victims. Earlier in 2016, several more reports made headlines around the world, including allegations that were never disclosed by the UN. The system still has to improve a lot because uh, those soldiers who have been accused of rape and sexual abuse, uh, almost none of them have been held accountable. In the midst of this all, the Assistant Secretary General for Field Support, Anthony Bambury, quit, citing the UN's failure to uphold its principles. It's hard to imagine the outrage that uh, people working for the United Nations and for the causes of peace and security feel when these kinds of allegations uh, come to light. Um, particularly involving minors, which are so, it's so hard to understand. After we sent the UN the damning allegations in this film, they agreed to let us speak with the Undersecretary General for Field Support, Atal Kare. Sex crimes in conflict zones by foreign troops is nothing new. I think what people are um, angry about is the UN's mishandling of it. And, you know, just that the UN doesn't address these cases unless whistleblowers and media hold their feet to the fire. Why is that? That would not be exactly true. Uh, cases come to me, for example, right now, I'm dealing with cases which are likely to emerge in the Central African Republic, uh, and we do take action. Just last night, yet another report was leaked by the Code Blue campaign that detailed many SDA crimes, one involving peacekeepers who tied up four girls and forced them to have sex with a dog. One girl died of an unknown disease afterward. So I would imagine at some point, you have to consider whether these peacekeepers are doing more harm than good. I agree. In fact, uh, this has been the consistent principle of the United Nations. But the, the principle Secretary doesn't General. seem to be in practice, right? Because this continues to happen. Just on Monday night, there was another case of a woman who reported that her daughter was raped by a Congolese uh, UN peacekeeper in the CAR. These are the CR cases which I mentioned to you, which we are following up. We shall first and foremost uh, take every measure to assist the victims, uh, particularly of such horrendous acts. Do you think that there's a systematic issue with um, leaving it to member states to prosecute their own personnel? Because many of these member states, India included, have abysmal records for prosecuting sex offenders. Uh, that is not exactly true. There are imprisonments which have been awarded in uh, India or United States or, or elsewhere. United Nations, you are well aware, we are an organization. We do not have our own criminal laws, we do not have our own judges, we do not have our own prisons after the judges. Uh, so therefore, the responsibility squarely belongs to the member states. We spoke to an American UNPOL officer who mm -hmm. says that she was fired from a mission after reporting two cases of sexual assault. How can the UN say that they're committed to 
creating change if they won't even listen to people who are raising issues. You know, we have a very strong policy, nearly 10 year old, on uh, protection for whistleblowers. In fact, uh, any retaliation against a whistleblower is simply unacceptable. In fact, there is a responsibility on part of every UN staff member to report wrongdoing whenever he or she sees it. You're describing the UN's handling of that CAR case as not the best way. Marie Deschamps and her independent panel said it was gross institutional failure. Is there a sort of allergy to admitting failure? No, no. I have admitted it. Maybe it, uh, the language uh, is a bit different. Perhaps I am more uh, used to, by my training uh, as a physician, to use uh, a temperate language. But yes, we admit uh, that uh, when I say it was not the best, that for me is already acknowledgement of a serious failure. Mm -hmm. Who do you think should be held accountable at the UN for these uh, mishandlings? I think uh, first and foremost, the alleged perpetrator should be held responsible because that is where the problem lies. We strongly believe, and I believe the member states strongly believe, that there should be absolutely zero tolerance for such cases. The U.S. does believe in a zero tolerance policy, and as the single largest donor to peacekeeping operations, paid for by taxpayer dollars, it's perhaps the only body that can hold the U.N. accountable. The U.S. Senate recently called a hearing over the U.N.'s failure to handle these sex crimes. What is wrong with the Secretary General of the U.N.? This report was written, the one of the, that you referred to is, is 10 years old. What, what is wrong with him? What is wrong with him? I mean, is he just so inept, inept that he can't cause a, a body like this to keep this from happening? over and over and over again, and we're just now beginning to, to put processes in place. What is wrong with him? The allegations that have been made, not just in Carr, uh, but Ambassador uh, Coleman, as you've uh, outlined, across dozens of different UN missions across decades now, uh, are simply shocking and unacceptable. And it is the United States that is footing most of the bill for most of the peacekeepers who are committing these atrocities against men and women and children. And if the very people who we are funding, training, equipping, supporting uh, to be peacekeepers can't be trusted to keep the peace and instead are committing crimes, then our support for UN peacekeeping is at risk of doing more harm than good. Since this hearing, the UN has improved its approach to these cases. It's now up to those in power to ensure these changes make a true difference.